if this is all you remember about the Bible story of Daniel, then it's time you got the rest of the story. It's a good thing I hey, yeah. you want me a prayer, oh, hey, yeah. I just call your name, yeah. you will be right there, be right there for me, oh, oh, there's one thing I know, oh, you are in control, oh, I can count on you, count on you always. They see him here. They see him here. And they see him here. We know it because he said it. Jesus said, the world will see him when the world sees us. That's why together we do this. We give so that those who've not yet seen can see. It means something when the world sees how we give. It means something because we do not look the same. It means something because we do not sound the same. It means something because when we give, this is what the world sees. They see the gospel doing what the world cannot. They see the gospel making us one. And so we give. We give so that missionaries can go. We give so that churches can be started, hurts can be healed, and truth can be shared. We give so the world might see Jesus in us. United, United as one. Uh, my name is Jeremy Islick. I'm your Deacon of the Week. Um, got uh, quite a few announcements today. Um, it seemed like every couple of minutes somebody came up and said, Hey, did you get the announcement about this? Did you get the announcement? There's a lot going on here at Fairview, and we want all of you to be a part of it. Uh, first of all, if you're a guest, uh, there's a little card in the back of your pews. If you'd fill those out, we'd just like to get a record of your attendance. Um, maybe I'll send you a thanks for coming, something like that. Uh, we're not coming to, to hawk you down or nothing like that. So on to our, some of our announcements. You saw the video about um, Vacation Bible School. There is a QR code in your bulletin. You can uh, either fill out or go to the QR code and, and sign up there, or you can see Ms. Kane's story uh, about volunteering. We're going to need lots of volunteers. Also, I was asked to announce about the uh, Women on a Mission, uh, the Feast for East, uh, Thursday, March the 23rd. Please see uh, Miss Kathy Norman about that, uh, or you can sign up on the, there's a sign-up link on the Facebook page. There's also the QR code in the bulletin, and uh, there's also another sign-up page in the Connection Corner, so you can't say that you can't find out how to help with that. Uh, we'd love to have your help. The, uh, one more thing, um, Monday night, tomorrow night, 6.30, Miss Donna, will be the speaker. She is a WRC Ultra Tech volunteer. That's for the Women on a Mission. Uh, so they'd love to have you out there at that. Um, I think that is all the announcements. Am I forgetting anything else? That's it. Let's bow our heads in prayer and we'll start our worship time. Lord, uh, with everything that we are, we wish to honor you. Uh, show us how to live a life um, that is in line with your character. Teach us to live a life um, that brings you glory. You're worthy of all our praise all our affection and love. Thank you for drawing us closer to your heart. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Lord, today we want to honor you. We want to honor everything that you have and you are. We love you and you praise you in your precious and holy name. Amen. For our kids' time down front. So kids, most of you are already down there. Y'all come on down here with me for Children's Church as we get started this morning. It's always a special time. Y'all stand out here in front of me, so let me have some room here. Y'all sit out here. It's always a special time, the first of the month, to have you guys come down and sing with us and help us with worship. Y'all go ahead and sit down. And to be reminded that each month we have our faith family verse. And our faith family verse for this month comes out of the book of Proverbs. And I'll be preaching on that in a little bit later. But one of the things that our faith family verse says is that God doesn't like people who lie. Do you know how to lie? You, you all know how to tell a lie? Parents, do you all agree? <laughs> all right, I need you all to stand up to help me out with something. You all all stand up with me. Let's take our hand, put your hand out here. 
Make the duck caulk. Y'all know how to talk with your hand? Yep. All right. Everybody needs to, I want everybody to tell me their favorite thing that they did this past week, okay? Tell me now. Use your hand. No, don't use your mouth. Use your hand. Just. All right. Y'all did a good job. Now, hey, did anybody lie to me? No. Y'all stay standing. Okay. Now, here's what I want you to do. Take your hand and take it like this. Close it and put it next to your mouth. Mm -hmm. And go like that. What is that? That's a kiss. All right, you guys can sit down. I'm going to read to you guys a Bible verse. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 26 says that he who gives an honest answer gives a kiss. Did you know that? So that when you tell the truth, the Bible says it's just like giving a kiss. Now, would you rather somebody give you a kiss? Or punch you in the face. No, we don't. All right, so here we go. Let's take our hands. All right, tell me your favorite food. Some of you got like 10 favorite foods. You just keep going like this. You're like you're eating it right now. So this week, here's what I want to ask you to do. When something happens... And it's easier to lie than tell the truth. I want you to take a minute and think about what the Bible says. And instead of telling a lie, just walk up to somebody and go, Mwah. because it's better off to give somebody a kiss than to tell a lie, right? It's better to tell the truth because that's just as nice as giving someone a kiss. Now, I understand not all of us like to give everybody a kiss, but I know every one of you would love to have a kiss from mommy and daddy. So make sure you're telling the truth back to them and giving them a kiss by telling the truth, okay? Let's ask God to help us tell the truth this week. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for these children, Lord. Thank you that they have in front of them the Word of God to tell them how to live their lives according to your plan for them. And Lord, help each one of them to understand that lies hurt other people and lies hurt them. But Lord, when we tell the truth, your word tells us it's just like giving a good kiss. And Lord, help us to want to tell the truth this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, some of y'all are going to go up here right. and sing and others back to their seats. This is going to be a little messy for just a second because we did not get to practice on Wednesday. Okay, so I'm going to get... Come on up and spread yourselves out too. We've got a whole bunch of people here that want to worship the Lord today. <laughs> now, Jeremy, we practiced this at 8.30 this morning. So. But in, in all honesty, it is a joy to sing with the kids every Wednesday night when we have Wham. And if you're not coming to Wham, kids, you ought to. We have a lot of fun. Um, and we don't just sing, I promise, we play games, and, and most importantly, we learn about Jesus. And um, the kids the past couple of weeks, or the past couple of months, have really been looking at how much God loves us. And I wanted to um, introduce you to a new song, and we didn't get to practice on Wednesday, so we're just going to save that one for later. But we're going to reprise a couple of songs that we've done over the past year, and the first one is called Wonderful, and I've asked the praise team to, to join with us, and you have heard it before, so I'm going to ask you, you can stay seated, but please sing along with us. 
The second song we're going to do is called Love the Lord, and it's actually from our Vacation Bible School last year. So I thought it was kind of cool that we had the Babylon um, announcement for VBS this year. It's Our Vacation Bible School this year is going to be an immersive Vacation Bible School. We're going to Babylon, and we're going to learn about Daniel, and it's very I'm very excited about what we're going to do there. But we have those two songs, and then I'm going to ask you to stand and join with us for the last two songs, which um, you'll be familiar with when we get there. So kids, are we ready? Okay, well, I'm going to step back just a little bit. Malaya, when it's time for the second song, you're going to come up and help me, right? Excellent. Okay, so join with us if you're familiar with these songs.
stand with us as we sing what a friend we have in Jesus.
Parents, thank you so much. I'm going to let you guys head back down to your families. And we've got one more song we want to share with you, and this one most of you are familiar with. It's a song called Ancient Words. And Brother Glenn, you had t you had kind of challenged me to find a song that was appropriate to the faith family verse, and this is what I came up with. So. But it, it's one of my favorites that our, our choir has sung before, but we've sung it so often I know that you know the words too, so please sing along. Ancient words. Oh, oh. 
thought maybe Leland wanted another kiss from me. I love our kiddos, and I love those folks who are giving so much time to love on them. Y'all are so wonderful to love on them the way you do. It's a wonderful to let them be a part of our worship, especially the first Sunday of every month. And uh, I know we've also got uh, time planned coming soon for the Youth Praise Band, some of them to be leading us as well. Looking forward to that. And of course, as much as we are enjoying and grateful for the worship time that we have each Sunday, we and appreciate Christy. We still want to keep praying, and she wants us to keep praying for that ne next worship leader. So let me encourage you to do that. Go ahead and open your Bibles up to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 6. I saw some of you, it looked like you were already turning over to Luke, and I'm glad that you're getting in the habit of that. But wanted to take a break from our time going through Luke to look at our faith family verse for the month, which is in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. And we'll be reading those together in a few minutes, but this is different from most of our faith family verses. It is different in length, especially, because it's multiple verses instead of one short verse. And uh, we try to keep them short so that the kids can learn them along with mom and dad. Uh, and I think we did a good job of just emphasizing one part of what God hates. He hates lying when we looked at Proverbs 24 today. But, you know, as churches go, we are often more known for what we are against than what we are for. And if we're going to be against something, it needs to be what God is against. And if I'm going to be for something, it needs to be what God is for. While churches are usually known for what they're against, in today's culture, God is known more for what he is for than what he is against. God is love. The culture wants to emphasize that God is love, and rightfully so that God is merciful, God is gracious. And all of those are important aspects of the character of God. But when we look at this verse in Proverbs chapter 6, these verses in Proverbs 6, and discover what God hates, what we're learning is that by knowing what God hates, we understand more about what He loves. And we understand more about his love. In fact, understanding what God hates allows us to be faithful in demonstrating God's love in the world around us. Now, what is it that the world knows about God? What is it that we know about God? As we worked our way through the book of Daniel, we spent some time talking about the character of God. Let me just remind you of some of those characteristics of God that we highlighted as we work through the book of Daniel. God is faithful. He is infinitely and unchangingly always true. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. We saw also that God is good. Psalm 34.8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. God is gracious. Psalm 145.8, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and great in loving kindness. God is just. He's the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteousness and upright is he, Deuteronomy 32 says. Of course, we know that God is love. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And we saw also about God's mercy, Romans 9, 15 through 16. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. God is good. There is no doubt about that. God is not just good, God is wise. Romans eleven thirty three. 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. 
You see, not only can we not fully understand God's love, we cannot fully understand God's judgment. But there is a glimpse into how and why God judges that we find in Proverbs chapter 6. And so we have to ask ourselves as we move into this passage, does God hate? We're going to look at that, and it's going to, the verses in just a minute, and says, these things God hates. And we think, is God capable of hate? That's a difficult question. We don't really want to think that God can hate because we are sinful when we hate. You and I cannot rightfully, completely, in an unsinful way, love. My love for my wife is not always perfect. God's love for my wife is always perfect. And because my love cannot always be perfect, if I am overcome with hate, it's most likely a sinful hate. But God, because there is no sin in him, because God loves perfectly, he can also hate perfectly. That's a difficult concept. It's not something that you would hear preached about a lot. But Scripture is clear about the things that God hates, and we're going to look at those in just a moment. But when you look at the world around you, you see that both those who are declared righteous in Jesus Christ and those who are declared His enemies, both have a choice in how they express their emotions and how they live their lives. And ultimately, everyone will stand before God. And so in order for us to fully understand God's love, God's judgment, God's righteousness, we need to understand the things that God hates. So would you stand with me as we look at Proverbs chapter 6, beginning at verse 16. The Lord hates six things. In fact, seven are detestable to him. Arrogant eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that plots wicked schemes, feet eager to run to evil, a lying witness who gives false testimony, and one who stirs up trouble among brothers. Dear Heavenly Father, would you allow us to see from your word today a more full and beautiful picture of who God is. And Lord, as we understand the love of God and the things that God hates, Lord, would you help us to see today how all of that helps us to understand how we individually and as a local church matter to God. Lord, would you help in an understanding of sin to Draw us unto you to help us sense and see the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Lord, that you would allow one who is separated from you from their sin today, Lord, to repent of their sin, to trust in you and Savior and Lord. And Lord, would you help that saint today that is struggling with sin to understand just how much sin matters to you. And how much you hate sin. And that your hatred from sin led your son Jesus to the cross. Because the only thing more powerful than what you hate is what you love. And you loved your son Jesus and you love your creation. And you love your glory. And Lord, today, as your word is proclaimed, I pray that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. A difficult-sounding passage when we begin to understand what God hates. As we see here, sin matters to God. And these sins that are listed here that God hates also tell us about what God loves. And so I want to look at these in a way that under, helps us understand what really matters to God. So first of all, when we see that 
the Lord hates in verse 17, arrogant eyes. What does that mean that he values? If he hates arrogance, he values humility. Jesus Christ was the ultimate example of humility, while Satan himself is the ultimate example of pride. Satan looks up at heaven and desires the throne of God for himself. Jesus, sitting on the throne, looks down at you and I, and he says, I desire that they would be saved. That's the difference between the arrogance and the humility that Jesus and God is asking us for. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the older. Yes, all of you be subject one to another. Be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Scripture's clear here that God values our humility. A proud look that God would hate, it comes out of a proud heart. Arrogant eyes begin with an arrogant heart. James chapter 4 verse 5 says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 28, he that is of a proud heart stirs up strife, but he that... Puts his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. Now, doesn't that sound like a good verse? (laughs) He that puts his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. Listen, that means that humility, which is an act of obedience to God, brings blessing. Obedience brings blessing. Humble obedience brings a good buffet, apparently. (laughs) All right. I thought I was going to lose you there for a minute, so I had to slide that one in. God values humility. Your humility your humility matters to God. Just for a, a biblical example to remember King Uzziah, 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 16 says, But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God, and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Uzziah thought, you know, listen, I am going to, there's no better person than to worship God than me. So I'm going to do it my way. And I'm going to go in that temple and I'm going to lead and worship even though I'm not supposed to. God has set aside someone and given them that task. And Uzziah fell because of his sin. You and I need to understand those truths. These six things God hates. The seventh is an abomination. When it says the sixth and the seventh, that's a Hebrew idiom just saying, listen, all these are equally important. And it's not an exhaustive list. So if your sin's not on this list, it's still sin. Okay, just want to clarify that. But first of all, we know that humility matters to God. So after we have arrogant eyes, we have a lying tongue. That tells me that truth matters to God. We tried to emphasize that in a gentle way with the children. But every single one of them admitted they were already professional level liars. And they learned it from their parents. Okay? That's just our nature. Our nature is to deceive because before Christ we are of our father, the devil, who is the great deceivers. Lies devalue God's truth. John eight forty four. Satan, he is a liar and the father of it. And a lie is something spoken with the design to deceive. There's all kinds of lies. In fact, we've got several categories of lies that we say they're white lies, they're sporting lies, they're practical jokes, they're just, I'm just ribbing somebody. We, We say things and we try to justify it by saying it's not a hurtful lie. But God is clear, every lie is hurtful to his glory because it's an attack on his truth. Some lies we use to attempt to make a a joke, to make sport. Some lies are meant to bring about mischievousness and meanness. Some lies are said to promote one's reputation. Some lies are said to blast the reputation of others. 
And here's a lie that we are probably all guilty of, a lie that is meant to conceal our faults and weaknesses. The reasons that we lie are many, but God hates lying. It's not just here in this scripture that we learn that. Psalm 5, verse 6, Thou shalt destroy them that speak lying. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. Psalm 101, He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. Proverbs 12, 12, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. God is serious about lying. How serious is is he? Remember Acts chapter 5. The church is blossoming and the people are having all things in common. Even to the point that many are selling their excess properties so that the money can be given to the church so that everyone's needs are met in that very trying time as the church is birthed and so many people are being shunned by their families, losing their businesses. It's an economic downfall to follow Christ at that time. Ananias and Sapphira, husband and wife, conspire with one another. We're going to sell some of our property, but we're not going to give it all to the church. Aren't you glad that the Lord just asking for 10% from you today? <laughs> okay, let's try that one again. <laughs> Acts chapter 5, Ananias comes into the church to make an offering, and he doesn't give it all. He grieves the Holy Spirit. He's challenged about it by Peter, and he lies, and he drops dead right there. They carried him out of the church to bury him. A little while later, his wife comes in. This might be a lesson for those of us whose wives come in after their husbands. <laughs> a little while later, the wife comes in, and she's challenged about it again. And she's a good, dutiful wife. She agrees with her husband. And Peter says, the, door, the feet at the doors are coming back from burying your husband, and now they're here to bury you. And she dies. Why? Because God is serious about his truth, and he hates lying. What else matters to God? Love matters to God. So again, we see there in verse 17, Arrogant eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. Murder denies the image of God. And who is the ultimate murderer? Satan. Again, go back to John 8, 44. If you want to remind yourself of who the devil is, that's a good verse to memorize. You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Satan has always been a murderer. He has murderous hands. But Jesus Christ, who is the example of God's love, has life-giving hands. John three seventeen. For God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world through, might be saved through him. Satan had murderous hands. Jesus had life-giving hands. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You see, the opposite of hands that shed innocent blood is a person who would lay down his life for another. God hates murder. God hates the evil intent that is in the heart of man that even thinks about Murder. So we find in the next verse, following it, verse 18, a heart that plots wicked schemes. God hates a heart that plots wicked schemes. That means that thoughts matter to God. In the New Testament, Jesus would teach that murder and adultery begin in our heart. Deceitfulness devalues God's plan for creation, and it devalues the worth of a person. Think about Adam, born into God's perfect creation, having cared for God's perfect creation, and then as sin entered into the world through Adam, and Adam is cast out of the garden, Adam lived for many hundreds of years. Even to the point he lived long enough 
to see what Noah understood. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. <laughs> the thoughts are what made God judge mankind. Not the actions, but the thoughts. The intent of the heart, the condition of the heart. We find Paul saying in Romans 1, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. My thoughts matter to God. But Jesus, there was no deceit in him. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26, for such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. There was nothing deceitful in God. There was nothing in God's heart that was at all deceitful. And then going on in verse 18, we find that our choices matter to God. Our choices matter to God. A heart that plots wicked schemes and feet that are eager to run to evil. I want you to understand that Satan can't be everywhere at the same time. Okay? He's not omnipresent. God is omnipresent. But Satan is as fast as Flash is. Job chapter 1. Look at what we know about Satan. Job chapter 1 verse 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Satan is a sprinter. And Satan spends his time running to where he can do his evil work. God hates what? Feet that are quick to run to evil. Do you understand that when you are living as Satan is, that your feet are always going in the way that Satan would be going? You are part of what God hates. But that's not the whole story we find later on. This is Satan and his destruction of all that was precious to Job, his, the testing of Job. Picking up at verse 16, it says, While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and has burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only I escaped alone to tell thee. Verse 17, While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yes, and have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I'm the only one that escaped to tell you. Verse 18, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead, and only I escaped. Do you see how fast Satan was moving? From place to place to place, everything that mattered to Job, Satan was running here and causing destruction, here and causing destruction, here and causing destruction, so that the bad news came to Job in a flood. Satan's feet were always moving towards evil. God hates figure, feet that are eager to run to evil. The wicked imaginations of man lead to the wicked actions of man. Micah chapter 2, verse 1. Woe to them that deviseth iniquity and worketh evil upon their beds. That is, they're laying there thinking about what evil am I going to do tomorrow. When the morning is light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hands to do so. Let me put it to you this way. Men, women... Teenagers who feed their minds on the filth of the world will always have feet that are eager to run to evil. When we feed on the things of the world, we are always going to be going towards mischief, if you want to put it in a kind way, troublemaking, stirring the pot, but let's call it what God calls it. It's evil, running towards evil. 
Matthew 12, 35, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Satan was deceitful, but what is Jesus running to? Jesus ran to the cross. Jesus left the glory of heaven and went to the cross so that he might make a way for the, all these things that God hates that infiltrates our hearts for us to be forgiven for those sins. Jesus is seeking not to destroy, but to seek and save the lost and to heal the lame. That's right. Amen. Two more that God hates. God hates a lying witness who gives false testimony. That tells me that my testimony matters to God. My testimony matters to God. And we can think of that testimony in two ways. First of all, we think of that testimony as how we live out our lives before the world. We need to be living out our testimony based on the truth of who God is. But more specifically, a lying witness who gives false testimony. One of the reasons so many people would lie, one of the reasons you and I would lie, is to put ourselves in a better position. To cover up our sins and to put another person in place to take the fault for our sins. But Jesus is the example that we need to follow. Revelation 1.5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Jesus is the faithful witness. When we are not a faithful witness in this world, we are being the opposite of who God is and who Jesus is and what matters to Jesus. And so we must be a faithful witness. Look at the crucifixion story of Jesus. After Jesus is betrayed and he is taken into custody and he is being moved from judgment to judgment. Scripture says in Matthew 26 that they were looking for false witnesses to testify against him. And they couldn't find many, but finally they find two who witness falsely against Jesus. But where were the true witnesses? Where were those who could give the true testimony? Where was the demoniac that he healed? Where was the lame that were walking, the blind that were seeing? Where were the lepers who were healed and cleansed? Where were they when it came time to testify to the truth of who Jesus Christ is? Church, why does God hate false testimony? Because when the true testimony could be given, no one was speaking up. Are you giving true testimony today? Not just by your presence here, but by your heart's attitude, by your commitment and love to the local church. I want you to see the connection that there is to the next thing that God hates. God hates a lying witness who gives false testimony. And then the seventh that God hates, one who stirs up trouble among the brethren. The church matters to God. The local church matters to God. God hates one who stirs up trouble among the brothers. God values truth. Listen to me. Truth will never stir up division. Truth will only stir up more truth. When we are speaking truth and love to one another, we're not causing division. We're causing love to be seen and exposed. But there's too much trouble not making that is denying the glory of God. Because in the church is the glory of God. Revelation 3, 20 and 21. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly... Or this is not Revelation, this is Ephesians 3, 20 21. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask and think. According to the power that works in us. Unto him be glory in the church. We've been praying that verse for a year now about what to do with the property next door. 
And God is revealing that and doing that, and it is him that is going to be glorified in what is done with the property next door and the ministry that's going to blossom out of it. But too many people are focused not on the glory of the church, but on their own good reputation and on their own desires, and it is in opposition to the glory of God. So let me say this. When you go to speak about the church, someone in the church, someone in the community, someone in your life, someone in your home, when you just go to speak, is it kind? Is it helpful? Is it true? Because your words matter to the glory of God. Your words matter to the bride of Christ, the local church. And I want you to understand this other truth because this is a difficult concept. We've got two, you know, does God hate anything? Well, that's something we're not used to, but yes, he does. There's one other truth in here. Read this verse again, these verses with me again, and I want you to notice something. The Lord hates six things. In fact, seven are detestable to him. He hates arrogant eyes. He hates a lying tongue. He hates hands that shed innocent blood. He hates a heart that plots wicked schemes. He hates feet that are eager to run to evil. He hates a lying witness who gives false testimony. All of those are things that God hates. But now, this last one is the person that God hates. And one who stirs up trouble among brothers. Do you see the shift there? There are many things that God hates. But in this verse, we see that God is hating the person that is stirring up trife. And that teaches us a whole lot about some, some true doctrine regarding sin and who God is. This passage doesn't just tell us about the things that God hates. It tells us about the people that God hates. And so we think about that saying, well, God hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. There is no doubt that God loves everyone. God is love. His love is perfect. But because God's love is perfect, his judgment and his hatred can also be perfect. So God can hate the sinner in their sin, which is why judgment is real. And judgment is eternal. And God is serious about what he hates. The emphasis here on this last thing that God hates it is not saying that God hates one who causes strife more than he hates a liar. The emphasis here is that God truly, completely, perfectly, and righteously hates sin. God, because he is holy, can judge sin. God, because he is holy, can hate sin. And God, because he is holy, doesn't just say that humility matters, love matters, truth matters, the local church matters. God is saying in this verse here that you matter to him. Because the greatest act of God is that while he looks on the sin of man, and he has a holy hatred for the sin of man, his love is perfectly balanced with that hatred to lead him to send in his perfect plan before the foundation of the world to send his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. Because while God hates perfectly, he loves perfectly. We see God's love in creation we see God's love in salvation, and we're going to see God's love in our ultimate sanctification when we are glorified and with him in heaven. But sandwiched in between all that good news is the hatred that God has for sin. Sin does matter to God, but it matters to God because he loves you. He loves me. He loves these little children that we're up here singing today. He loves our young people who are faithful to be up on the front row. They've got their Bibles open. They were taking notes. He loves them. He wants them to know how great his love is for them. But he doesn't want you to miss out on how serious he is about your sin. 
He doesn't want us to miss out on how serious he is about sin. Tomorrow is March 6th. On the sixth day of the month, read the sixth chapter of Proverbs, right? Read this again tomorrow. Don't just let it go with you today. Read it tomorrow. Guys, you want to find out how wonderful your wife is? My wife's birthday is, Mar is the 5th of March. So the 5th of every month, I'm reading Proverbs chapter 5. And especially in March, I'm thankful for what it says about a good woman. Read Proverbs daily. It is talking to you and I about all the good things that keep us in the right path each day. But the most important truth we can find in Scripture is that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us because you matter to God. Whatever God is doing in your heart today, I pray that you would respond to that. Perhaps he's convicting you of sin and you need to make that right where, with him today before you leave here. You can use these steps as an altar. Pray where you are. There are plenty of others who would be glad to pray with you today. Perhaps you have seen your sin in light that you've never seen it before as the Holy Spirit is calling you unto salvation today. I pray that you would hear that call, respond to that call, and profess him before men so that he might profess you before his Father. Perhaps you've seen how much Christ, how much God values the local church today. And you desire to unite with a local church and commit yourself to serving God through the local church. I pray that you would do that today and join the local church. Perhaps as you have understood the seriousness of who God is, you understand that he is serious about serving him. And you may be called to sign up to serve in vacation Bible school with Wham. You may be saying, I need to learn more, so I need to get involved in a Sunday school class. Or perhaps you're being called into surrendering yourself to full-time ministry. Whatever the Lord has laid on your heart today, I want you to respond to it. We're going to have a hymn of decision after I pray. Let me ask you to stand with us as we pray. We're going to sing and have a hymn of decision. Whatever the Lord is leading you to do, I pray that you would do that today. Dear Heavenly Father, in your great goodness, you have shown us in your word all that we need to know about who you are, about your character. And we know that you are love and that you love perfectly, which justifies you hating sin. And Lord, help us to hate sin like you do. But Lord, help our understanding of your righteousness, your love, your justice, and what you see about sin. Lord, would you help it to help us understand how much you love us and how much we matter to you. We ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our hymn. The Savior is waiting.
Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. In him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. Thank you, and y'all have a good night.